We're swimming in high stakes tests in the U.S. educational system. Even when I was in public school in North Carolina, it felt like a class didn't count if it didn't have some major test at the end of the road, some end of grade test, end of course test, AP test, something that made the teachers freak out. And along with them, the principals and the superintendents on up the chain until you probably find in Raleigh some quaking bureaucrat. When I was a high school teacher, I got to see and experience that pressure firsthand. I think I was more nervous waiting for my kids' AP scores than they were to take them. Now that I'm a parent, I've got pits in my stomach as I think about my daughter taking tests in kindergarten. Now, one reason we have so many tests in public schools across the country is the federal No Child Left Behind Act that was signed into law in 2002. But the reason that we have testing-based performance accountability as part of No Child Left Behind is that policymakers were convinced, based on the experiences in various states, that this was a good idea. One of these model states was North Carolina, which had an annual testing program dating back to the late 1970s. In this video, we'll look at the logic of its implementation, the challenges that it encountered, and we'll consider some of the reasons that the annual testing program in North Carolina not only persisted, but became more and more interwoven into the fabric of the state educational system. Now, the annual testing program, like the minimum competency testing program, was something that was the brainchild, in many respects, of Governor Jim Hunt, who proposed both of these in his 1976 campaign. Starting in 1978, the annual testing program hit students in five different grade levels, one, two, three, six, and nine, to check up on how well they were learning the basic skills of reading and math. The idea was that it was especially important in the early years to make sure that students weren't falling behind. We must make sure each year that each student is making the progress he should be, said Jim Hunt. Now these were supposed to be low stakes tests, and they were, at least initially. Unlike the competency testing program, the annual testing program wasn't created to hold students accountable or teachers or administrators for that matter. Take a look at this initial fact sheet that the state put out just after the program started. This fact sheet emphasizes that these tests weren't tied to any sort of punishment or reward, which was something that the North Carolina Association of Educators, the state's teacher union, was worried about. Relax, teachers. It's just about improved planning. It's just about improved identification and correction of student deficiencies. Of course, the bureaucrats couldn't quite help themselves. They let that accountability word creep into even this soothing fact sheet but at least they pitched it as an opportunity. Saying that these tests could help diagnose student problems and finding tests that actually did that were two different things. It didn't help that there wasn't a set North Carolina curriculum that the state could use as a basis for these tests. So the testing commission instead imported tests designed initially for other states. Some academics warned the Hunt administration of the difficulties of translating diagnostic information into student improvement pointing to a study that 50 different reading specialists made 50 different recommendations, contradicting themselves when given a thinly disguised repeat case. All it will do is give us a batch of figures, warned Duke education professor Ann Adams. As a primer on testing for policymakers noted, the cost of testing can easily exceed its utility. There were other concerns. Teachers, as mentioned, were worried that these possibly arbitrary test results would be used either to punish or reward them. Some education professionals had the opposite worry, that the test would eventually become competency exams to hold students accountable without addressing the problem of lousy teaching. Now, as some context here, the policy conversation around testing was particularly polarized during this period of the 1970s. On the one hand, you had grouchy business people and politicians fretting about declining skills and test scores most notably on the SAT. The SAT, along with other so-called aptitude tests, were supposed to be tests of your essential capacity as a human being to succeed in higher learning. It was something you were supposedly not able to study for. Much of the decline of the SAT was actually a good sign. More people were trying to go to college, so there were more people taking the test, so the denominator was growing. But still, with stagflation and all, a lot of influential people were worried about what those youngsters were learning. They blamed touchy-feely progressive education and 
yearned for a return back to the basics. On the other hand, this was also a period when standardized testing was facing serious criticism for cultural bias and for overstating its usefulness. A bunch of books in the late 1970s and early 1980s ripped apart the notion that these multiple choice exams could test aptitude of any kind, showing the ways they were culturally biased or centered on a testing logic that didn't translate into real world skills. Stanley Kaplan and other tutors were able to show pretty successfully that you could actually study for these tests. Ralph Nader, who at the time had an enormous footprint as a public interest advocate, went after the Educational Testing Service, the nonprofit that ran the SAT and other tests. Articles like this one in Harper's proclaimed its last days. Gregory Anrig, the president of ETS, had to defend his organization, arguing that the gap between white and black scores was closing and that improvement was happening most quickly in the Southeast thanks to desegregation. Anrig argued that testing might actually help in the fight for equity. We do not cure a virus by throwing away the thermometer, he wrote in a widely circulated education journal. Publishing test scores by racial group would help close the gap and raise educational standards. Such logic eventually won the day with the No Child Left Behind Act, and the North Carolina results of the annual testing program in the late 1970s was a prelude. When North Carolina scores improved in 1979 over 1978, the testing commissioners were circumspect. Whether the high achievement was caused by the programs or high enthusiasm, we don't know, said annual testing commission chairman Frank Yeager. But when they got better again in 1980, Governor Jim Hunt crowed, for the first time in history, students in our first, second, third, and sixth grades are scoring at the national average in reading and math. The newspaper noted that they actually were at the median, not the average, and Hunt didn't mention the ninth grade, since its median score was below the national average. Still, some educators proclaimed that Hunt and the tests were rescuing students from semi-literacy and ignorance. While it might seem strange that North Carolinians were super excited about being average, you have to understand that the state was not accustomed to being even average for virtually the entire 20th century. The same editorial noted that North Carolinians were still more poor, more illiterate, more nutritionally deficient, with worse housing and higher infant mortality than the rest of the nation. North Carolina still ranked dead last in manufacturing wages, but hey, at least we're normal when it comes to elementary level reading and math. With some seeming success, the testing commission pushed to extend the test to science and writing. Never mind that writing was much more complicated to administer and score than multiple choice tests. And just as many teachers and school officials feared, once these test scores were out there, politicians and administrators tried to find ways to use them to hold students and teachers accountable. By the early 1980s, Governor Hunt was trying to find a way to make the test requirements for promotion to the next grade. And by the 1990s, the scores were used to give bonuses to teachers for good scores and to grade entire schools. The lesson of this might well be, if you create the data, the eggheads just can't help themselves, but find a way to use it to judge and evaluate. The North Carolina Annual Testing Program meant as a low stakes program and only about half the grades to help teachers figure out how to better instruct students morphed into a pressure cooker that obsessed superintendents, principals, teachers, and to a lesser degree students, though they did have to pass the test to make sure that they could go on to the next grade. Whether these tests improve schools is uncertain, but we should be comfortable in guessing that politicians will always find it appealing, an almost irresistible silver bullet.